So very excited to bring you the next session because it's the launch of what you've been, what has been alluded to several times during the day, the State Capacity Initiative. We have a panel of distinguished and experienced statesmen and policy experts who will respond to perhaps one of the most vital questions we can ask of the Indian policy space today. What would it take to build a 21st century state for India. In a sense, this is the question around which all of CPR Dialogues 2020 has been sort of built around. And without uh, much ado, I'd like to invite you, Mekla. Okay. <laughs> Yamini is going to say a few words, and then Mekla will introduce the initiative to you before the panel starts. Before. Before we do that uh, and, and get, get back into the heart of the issues, I did want to take this opportunity uh, to say a few words about the Center for Policy Research and why we are having these dialogues. I know some of you have been with us through the day and thank you very, very much uh, for staying with us from the morning. And uh, I have to say, I am really impressed with your uh, staying power and brain power. <laughs> For, for having absorbed everything. Um, but um, for, those of, for those of you who've been here, please bear with me, and for those of you who've just joined us, uh, I did want to say that uh, our center has been engaged at the cutting edge of public policy now for the better part of 45 years. Uh, we, we turned 45 last year. We were founded in 1973. And we were founded in 1973 with, in some ways, the core, a core mission that remains perhaps even more relevant today than it was uh, back in 1973, which was to find a, to create a space for research to be able to build in long-term thinking uh, into the space of policy making, which often, uh, because of the everyday, uh, contends to conflate the short term with the long term. And that policy makers in and of themselves uh, are so busy dealing with the challenges of the day, that there are very few spaces in which there are opportunities to actually frame the big questions, build on ideas, and, in, and sort of move away from the challenge of what needs, what, what should be done to implement to what should be done because it is normatively the right thing to do. Um, and it was with that spirit that the, that the Center for Policy Research began to build research into uh, the the art of policy making and create different kinds of spaces for exchanges and engagement with the policy making space. Over the years, as policy making itself evolved, inevitably, therefore, did the role of the Center for Policy Research. And particularly in the 2000s, as research as a core function of our university system began at least to some degree becoming less central to the role that universities play in our in public life and our institutional life, the center took on the role of uh, building research uh, much more front and center than it ever had in the past, building research not just through practitioners, but also through academics, creating a robust space for public policy-related research for which the university system had somewhat left a very large vacuum. To the present, one of the big challenges that we confront in current public discourse today is that of creating spaces for independent, nonpartisan, rigorous, evidence-based, not 150 characters, not 250 characters, certainly not uh, hours and hours, uh, but short, <laughs> succinct, and yet important spaces for public conversation. We felt as our research uh, was uh, contributing quite significantly in the academic space, uh, and through that engaging robustly with policymakers, uh, that ultimately the art of policy making in the 21st century is not 
not just about uh, conversations that happen one-on-one -on -one with individuals or conversations that happen behind closed doors in committees, but conversations that begin and end in the public domain. And it is those conversations that shape the context in which policymakers uh, build their frameworks, in which policymakers engage in those closed door committee meetings where they debate the nuts and bolts, and shape the kind, the final outcomes uh, which we as citizens have to then confront and vote for and vote with. Uh, and so to, to ensure that we held on to the importance of a public sphere that was independent, that was rigorous, that took difficult questions, hard questions, questions that may not give you the clickbaity headline, but were really very critical and central to the future of India, uh, and to open it up to be in conversation both with policymakers, with practitioners, with civil society, and with academics, as well as the public at large, in order to ensure that the future of India could really be debated through the realm of ideas, through the realm of careful, reasoned, rational discourse, away from the everyday of 250 characters. That that was the objective behind the Center for Policy Research's uh, CPR Dialogues. The forum was formally launched in 2018 with the first such dialogue, and this is the second. And I can't thank all of you enough for all your support, for being here in such large numbers, for bearing with us through the day, uh, for keeping your questions short, yet very critical and important, uh, and for encouraging us along the way. And especially, of course, thanks to all our speakers speakers who've taken time off from busy schedules, some who've flown overseas battling coronavirus, air pollution, uh, protests, and everything else uh, that uh, public life uh, globally today confronts to be here uh, to engage with us over these two days. With that, um, this is also a very exciting and proud moment for the center, uh, because this session uh, is uh, being organized to launch what is a one of of our new flagship initi research initiatives that really seeks to take lots of what we do and really front and center the question that is on top of everybody's minds, how do we get the Indian state to do its job, and not just the job that it's being challenged with as of today, but think forwardly to ensure that it does the job that it's being challenged with for the 21st century in ways that don't make the mistakes of the past, and ensure that two decades from now, or perhaps 40 decades from now, the Center for Policy Research, with some very different people, are not scratching their heads and asking the same question again. The reason why the question of state capacity became so central to our work is that a across every field that the center works in, whether it is the environment and climate change, the current challenge of air pollution, the challenge of urbanization, what we were just talking about, the challenge of building a regulatory architecture for technology that promotes innovation, uh, the challenge uh, of, uh, of, of public service delivery, the core human development agenda uh, that we left behind uh, somewhere in the, 21st, in the 20th century, even as we marched on into the 21st century. Um, that in each of these different domains, we inevitably confronted the question of how would it, what would it take to get the Indian state to move forward to fulfill these goals that it has set out for itself. Um, and across every single vertical uh, in which researchers at CPR were engaged with, many of the questions were often quite similar. The bureaucracy works in silos. Uh, there are too many hierarchies. It's very difficult to get the bureaucracy to engage with each other in ways that would make the system more deliberative, more engaged. The art of planning has long been forgotten. Um, the art of even doing simple things, as my work in the, in, in the accountability initiative showed us, just moving money uh, from the head of the, in, uh, of, of the bureaucracy all the way down through its arms and legs or uh, right to its feet, even that uh, can be such a mammoth task that it mostly doesn't happen. What will it take to get the state to, to move forward? And keeping that in mind, we felt, therefore, that it was perhaps important to, in fact, not just start, look at this question from our sectoral perspectives, but really tackle it head on by studying 
understanding and engaging with the Indian state for what it is more robustly and in a more engaged way. We were also quite surprised that there is very little in terms of public administration uh, research in India, considering how central the state is to everyday life. There's very little in terms of public policy literature that engages with the Indian state in its nuts and bolts, in its everyday. Uh, and, and therefore, not only is there a knowledge gap, there's also therefore a gap in how we think more forward looking. And it was with that that we set up the state capacity initiative that we will launch. Can I invite our chairperson, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath, just to say a few words before we uh, move into the proceedings of the evening? Distinguished panel and uh, friends, Yamini has done such a fabulous job with the CPR propaganda, and also she's done it with so much passion and style that there's very little for me to add to it. However, I, I, I thought that it, I just thought I want to share with all of us what a pleasure it is really for CPR to launch the State Capacity Initiative. Um, the question about what would it take to build a 21st century state for India goes to the heart of what is being described as the moral economy of the bureaucracy. Um, because it brings f into focus uh, the nature of the Indian state and the working of public institutions, the whole gamut of administrative reforms, recommended, sequestered, implemented, or simply hijacked. Um, embedded here, naturally, is a complex mosaic of perceptions, practices, beliefs that sometimes collide, collude, cohere, and, in, and that significantly determine the manner in which the people of India experience their rights and the quality of citizenship. Uh, so the interplay of opacity and porosity, transparency and accountability is undoubtedly contextually defined. Um, so to impose a sterile uniformity where a richer ambiguity exists is really to confine protean ideas of freedom into Procrustean breads. And that's not what we want to do, because we've seen when we are talking about the protection of freedoms, how it easily morphs into law and order delivery, for instance. Uh, while administrative responses and machinery must resist uh, the temptation to be gentle panopticons, uh, it is there has to evolve some kind of a bottom line, a consensus on where the citizen's quotidian experience of the state is infused with respect for her uh, entitlements. Now, public institutions, as we've seen, and, and there's been so much intense debate, especially in the context of the agricultural uh, agriculture panel, is often manned by very competent and well-meaning officials. Uh, but they are being called out almost on a daily basis in the of India uh, in light of a pervasive governmentality and in an increasing number of spaces, the state of exception becoming the norm of governance. I mean, we don't intend to invoke Foucault or Agamben here, but suffice it to say that the Indian state often oscillates uh, between the roles of protector and predator. Uh, it's neither consistently either. And it's not open, however, to negotiation by vulnerable categories of citizens, but it is often open to those negotiating its agenda or seeking entitlements through the benefits of democratic appeal. In addition, the Indian state today is also caught in a discourse where balancing human security and what is pervaded as national security has become a serious challenge. We've seen that through the discussions this morning. And this complex interplay of security and governance has witnessed a huge upsurge of the resistance movements that we see today, and that they have large numbers of women and young people. Another important tension is between democracy and difference, how the state deals with divisions and difference to deliver on equality of citizenship. So this project uh, is, is, is really is a response to these challenges. It is both ambitious, it's audacious, and it's innovative, supported by the Gates Foundation in partnership with the 
Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration. It is poised to undertake extensive re research across eight states, I think, initially, to collate data, to gain an in-depth understanding of how the administrative apparatus functions today. So just a few questions. What are its frames of reference and terms of engagement, the Indian state? What ethical frameworks does it deploy and invoke in its day-to-day -day functioning? Do transactional models prevail, or is there an altruistic purpose at all? What perspectives on deliberative democracy does it bring, bring into the consultative process? Are norms of transparency and accountability, accountability seen to be in tandem with the compulsions of effective delivery? How does the notion of the welfare state enter the contemporary imagination, or is it seen largely as a relic of a bygone solipsistic <coughs> socialist, and I use that in quotes, predilection, an anachronism in the age of globalization. How do de regulatory bodies work, and how coherent and credible are the institutions that employ or deploy these av avowed goals? These are, of course, normative questions, but as Yamini said, much, all our initiatives, be they the land rights initiative, the, the energy and uh, environment initiatives, the accountability, all converge really around this particular initiative and we see this as a vibrant hub of engagement, of dialogue, of discussion, and also creating a broad epistemic community that can engage with these issues and collaboratively offer, well, not solutions, but at least offer new questions and, uh, to the discourse. So over to Yamini Mekla and our distinguished panel, while unveiling with both optimism and anticipation, as I'd say, our program on state capacity. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great source of inspiration for us to have such a full house and, and a consistently full house today. Uh, it's a testimony to the energy and the youthful energy that has been infused into CPR, and it's going to continue to be that way. Thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Mekla Krishnamurthy, uh, and I'm very excited and uh, privileged to be able to welcome you here as the director of the new State Capacity Initiative at CPR. Um, we have learned actually from the writings and the work of many of you in the room. I think we have drawn on some of you quite extensively as we've built up this initiative. Uh, and we very much hope uh, that we'll have an opportunity to engage very substantially uh, with many more of you uh, as this initiative takes off. It's very much uh, in its early stages um, and it's a long-term commitment. So this is very, very warmly an invitation um, to engage with us as we as we build up the initiative. Um, so the State Capacity Initiative at CPR is an attempt uh, to place the critical challenges of building state capacity at the heart of policy research, the field of policy research in India. Uh, and in some ways, it has always occupied this space, but has also been surprisingly marginalized. And one reason for that marginalization is a continuous conceptual and empirical distinction that we make between the what and the how of Indian public policy, Indian public priorities, our public systems and programs. Um, and in the separation between the what and the how, most often the who of the state, uh, the question of who actually runs the state, particularly when it comes to grassroots workers and frontline functionaries, is usually systemically ignored. Um, the other problem with the separation between the who and the how, or policy and implementation, is that it sustains a very common criticism that we've all heard which is a narrative that is ultimately counterproductive, that India has good policy but poor implementation. Right? And this is something I think all of us know, that policy and law and policy that does not take implementation into account is not good law and policy. Right? And that law and policy must take implementation into account. But we have a further problem, which is that if you only embed or turn yourself to implementation, you often don't have the imagination 
to navigate very complex transitions. And so we have a problem thinking about the capacity to actually generate, formulate, and design good policy as well. So there's a double challenge. There's a challenge of policy and implementation, and then there's the challenge of policy that allows you to navigate the 21st century. And this is particularly important. Um, oh dear, this is what happens when formats change. Anyway, uh, this is particularly important uh, in light of the conversations we've been having throughout the day about the 21st century transitions that India is experiencing and how do we navigate these. Because I think every single panel has talked about the nature of the multi-generational challenges that we uh, confront. They're not 21st century challenges, they're probably challenges from every single century before the 21st century that we still have. We have a very large unfulfilled human development agenda at the same time that we have new realities and emerging challenges. We have conflicting pressures, competing claims, and there are multiplying and changing roles of the Indian state. You know, predominantly here is this move from provision to regulation and the critical questions of regulatory capacity. Uh, so how does India think about both the provision of public services, but also the regulation of markets? Um, and so this is another very key tension that we are experiencing. With this, we have greater complexity, diversity, and dynamism that the Indian state needs to fix, and large-scale problems that demand context-specific solutions. Uh, in all of this, the Prime Minister said in 2016 that India cannot march into the 21st century with 19th century administrative systems. Um, and so I think there is an re increasing realization, again, not a new one, that administrative reform is critical, um, but the question of how are we to actually address it? Does the Indian state have the capacity to credibly negotiate the transitions facing 21st century India? Is the current paradigm for state reform aligned to the challenges that it confronts? For us at the State Capacity Initiative, this focus on state capacity enables us to start with first principles and to create the common ground needed to build a shared vision for reform. Part of the problem is that so much of our debate around reform has also been extremely fractious and ideological. And by beginning and focusing and recentering our attention on state capacity, perhaps we can begin where we actually should. Um, so very briefly, I would like to tell you a little bit about our program of work and what we intend to do over the next few years. The State Capacity Initiative is intended as a long-term institutional commitment to building an ecosystem of engagement on questions of state capacity in India. In the first phase of our work, we've been very generously supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and particularly by Dr. Santosh Matthew, who's helped us think through this initiative and its scope and reach, and given us the flexibility to do and build a really, truly ambitious uh, work program. And I'll take you very briefly through what we think are the critical components of this ecosystem of engagement, and hopefully some of that will also set us up for our panel uh, discussion in a few minutes. So one of the things we've set ourselves the challenge of doing is thinking about what would an analytical framework for understanding and addressing the challenges of state capacity in India actually look like. And here I want to just flag you know, two key points. The first is that some of the very elements and qualities of the Indian state that we are most proud of when we think about India, diversity, um, democracy, decentralization, federalism, uh, these are precisely the elements or qualities that most people think hamstring us when we try and build state capacity. So often in the conversation you'll have, if only, and the, this is typified in the discussion we have, when we, particularly when we think about India-China, that you know, if there was, democracy is great, but it's not good for state capacity. Right? Decentralization is great, but it makes state capacity extremely difficult. Um, and for us, these are the questions that we have to think about at the core, which is what is the framework that will allow us to actually engage both with the normative questions that you outlined and the political economy of India? Right? And it needs to be something that allows us to imagine both the challenges and the possibilities of building state capacity in democratic and federal India. 
So for us, this is one critical tension in thinking about building state capacity and core to our analytical understanding of it. The second is, of course, the actual questions of building state capacity are enormously contradictory. Right? And you know, we often say that policy making is the art of making trade-offs. I think state capacity is, in many ways, the art of balancing tensions. Amongst these central tensions is the question of embeddedness and autonomy, embeddedness in society. And we often say that this is a great strength to be responsive, to be embedded. But the flip side of that embeddedness is often dominant capture and state capture. So embeddedness and state capture have often gone together. At the same time, we have this need for autonomy, autonomy in our institutions, the ability to actually exercise some distance. And yet, that distance could very easily become disinterest um, and actually attention. So this question of autonomy and embeddedness, the questions of administrative flexibility and discretion versus public accountability, the key questions of centralization, so the center and state centralization and decentralization. Many of these questions are not either or questions when it comes to state capacity. So we have to figure out how to actually design public institutions that balance these tensions rather than trading them off. And this is sort of, I think, what our analytical framework has to really sort of stretch itself to do. Um, the second core part of our work is going to be building a body of research. And Yamini already mentioned that um, when it comes to thinking about state capacity, there is a surprisingly thin literature. We already talked about how the bureaucracy is surprisingly thin in India. The literature on state capacity is also surprisingly thin. Um, and this is although there is a rich literature on the Indian state. I think the idea of state capacity as administrative reforms has meant that we've actually limited our engagement with these questions, particularly on the questions of the people and the who of the state. Um, so one major part of our agenda is to build up a really robust, rigorous body of evidence and meaningful synthesis that we'll do over the next several years. Um, for us, the core elements of this is that it will be cross-sectoral, it will focus on transversal or cross-cutting issues of state capacity. It will focus across sectors and across states and across levels. Um, and so it will be, in that sense, a very comparative project to be able to understand the state in all of these dimensions. Um, it's also necessarily, therefore, an interdisciplinary exercise. Um, and this is something where our small team, which is growing, we've really tried to engage uh, young and senior scholars across a range of disciplines. And I will do this in alphabetical order, since there should be no turf wars, starting with anthropology. Um, but anthropologists, economists, um, we have historians, scholars of law, literature, political science, public management. The idea is to really have a wide group of people engaged. Um, and of course, you know, like the tech panel, computer scientists and techies as well. And we also have a range of people with very diverse professional experiences. So we're hoping that this will also help us build up a very different understanding. Um, our fourth key, our third key priority is to build really deep networks of communities of practice uh, across the country. And here, not just focused on the higher bureaucracy um, and on the civil services, but really also thinking about the middle bureaucracy and the frontline state, um, and also to think very you know, creatively with both civil society and the media. And then we hope to deepen our engagement with catalytic design support engagements, deep engagements with specific state governments uh, over the next few years. At the heart of all of this is the question of building and deepening the public debate on state capacity. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we face in deepening this debate is that there is a pervasive and extreme disenchantment with the Indian state. Um, and so our biggest challenge when it comes to rethinking um, this agenda is can we actually collectively reimagine and um, redesign and reinvest in the, in the idea of a truly capable and accountable Indian state. Um, and so with that, actually, we can hand off to our panel, because this is precisely the kind of conversation we hope to be having in many different fora uh, with a wide range of people to think about the deep and critical challenges uh, of building state capacity in India today. I'll hand over to Yamini. Thank you. 
Um, may I invite our panelists to join us? Oops. No, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Junaid Emwood, Country Director of the World Bank. Dr. TVS Somanathan, Expenditure Secretary, Government of India. And Mr. Sanjay Mitra, uh, who is formerly Chief Secretary of the Government of Bengal. I did want to say also uh, that uh, Chief Minister of Meghalaya, uh, Mr. Conrad Sangma, was to be with us this evening. But owing to the unrest in Shillong, uh, it was very difficult for him to, to come to Delhi under the circumstances. And we can uh, I, I hope that peace will soon be restored uh, in Shillong and in Meghalaya, and in, in, in India more generally, uh, under the circumstances. So. With that. So thank you, Mekla. I think you, uh, you, you very well laid out uh, some of the big challenges and the big tensions that I hope that uh, we, we, we can use the opportunity this evening to debate and discuss. Uh, but before that, um, I think we often use the term state capacity on the assumption that everybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, I've also noticed that the Indian state tends to use words on the assumption that everybody's talking about. But it's a very clever strategy, because then nobody will admit they don't know and since we do since the Indian state operates with phrases acronyms and themes uh, that then create a nice little power structure around them it might be useful I thought first to just break down what we mean when we say when we say state capacity that India doesn't have state capacity seems to be now a fairly generally accepted consensus at least in the policy world but I don't know that we've actually scratched the surface and asked what that means because frankly when it comes to some things India has very good state capacity uh, you know uh, we, we often use the example of elections to say there are lots of things that India can do and can do very well but we also did roads we've also done polio we've done a whole range of things that uh, in and most importantly we've survived as a democracy which uh, in 1947 a lot of people had doubts about that takes a lot of state capacity so so to me, I think first things first, it's important for us to unpack when we say state capacity is a challenge, what do we mean? And Junaid, I'm going to turn to you to help frame this normative question for us, especially given that you've actually experienced working with the Indian state now for multiple decades in various different ways. So your perspective on uh, what, what it is that the Indian state is missing, where it's missing, will I think be very, very important in framing the discussion? I think it's uh, always a challenge for a Bangladeshi to say what is missing in an Indian state. <laughs> but uh, if you discount that challenge, I'll do my, my best. Um, I think you, in the way you asked the question, you actually gave, uh, gave us the, uh, the answer. You know, no, one will, no one will say that India does not have, say, capacity in engineering. If anything, we know that India has amazing capacity in engineering. Uh, yet, there's almost not a single town or city in India delivering 24-7 drinking water. Right? How is it that this engineering capacity cannot be turned into a system that delivers continuous water supply? Uh, and it doesn't stop there. You take, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the story of, uh, 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 of power. You have Power Grid in, uh, in India. This is a global class company. And yet, you have very difficult issue of electricity discounts. What is it that, on one hand, you have a capacity that delivers, another hand, the capacity does not deliver? I think the concept of state capability is how do you turn a capacity into uh, an accountable system of delivery in which that capacity is allowed to innovate, in which that capacity is held accountable, and in which that capacity delivers. So uh, in the case of uh, water, uh, we know that one of the biggest challenges India has is most of its water delivery is put inside government departmental structures. So you cannot hold anyone accountable for that delivery of that service. Uh, you have a, a water department that does not price water. And therefore, the way it finances it is a relationship between the politician, the bureaucrat, 
and the department, nothing to do with uh, what the citizen wants. So when we talk about state capability, one is really talking about a state that is able to deliver to citizens and to be held accountable by citizens. But it's not a technical capacity that's missing. It's really the institutional capability of being held accountable for that delivery to citizens. That's what we are, we, I think we, are, uh, uh, we need to focus on. What will it take for a water department to become an accountable water delivery agency? Uh, so I'll give you, give you an example. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, uh, Himachal uh, came to the World Bank and said, look, we're facing a crisis on water in Shimla. Uh, we not only are not being able to deliver enough water, but we have uh, jaundice, health issues with water. Uh, what this really means is we need to build another source of supply for water. And my reaction to that was, it's easy to fund another source of supply, and we have the engineering capability of finding that source of supply and getting the water to Shimla, but in effect what you will do is a new pipe into a leaking bucket. Can you actually fix that leaking bucket before you bring in more water? And fixing that leaking bucket meant taking three departments of uh, water delivering, supposedly delivering water to citizens of Shimla, combining them into one agency, getting that agency outside of uh, PWD uh, and making it a corporate entity that can be held accountable, and then giving it the ability to hire, fire, make decisions, uh, invest in operations and maintenance, and most importantly, be held accountable by citizens. How do you do that? You place that uh, utility inside the political realm of a municipality that's supposed to be accountable to citizens. So you move from a capacity that exists but that doesn't deliver, but a new institutional framework in which that capacity is held accountable for delivering. And that's what we would say is state capability. How you create that is really uh, the big challenge uh, that I think uh, uh, the agenda that you're trying to focus on uh, would, would, uh, would really uh, uh, emphasize. Dr. Sobhanathan, if I can bring you in here, one of the most, uh, if state capability is fundamentally about a, about a state that is responsive <coughs> and accountable, uh, one of, at least in the public imagination, one of the fun, one of the first things that people will say is that the reason why the Indian state fails is because the Babu is accountable only to himself or herself, and that's because we have a permanent civil service. There's something about our recruitment, there is something about uh, the, the nature of hierarchy and the promotion system, and most of all, it is because you cannot fire. The answer always boils down to, well, move, change the terms of the contract, start firing, and things will change. Your thoughts? I think uh, you've obviously touched upon what a lot of people feel, and I know Mr. Narayan Murthy, for instance, thinks that uh, if we just adopted, um, if we adopted uh, Infosys's method of personnel management, that would basically solve most of the problems of the public service, something that I don't agree with, but I think uh, we have to, we have to look at this issue in terms of how other democracies work as well. And, what I'm going to do is behave like a typical uh, Indian civil servant. <laughs> I've just had a bad day at the office, so I'm coming with poor preparation and hoping that general smarts will make up for not having prepared. But anyway. We'll talk the, about generalists and yes, specialists that, that, in a <laughs> So, uh, but if, if I look at, I'm sorry? Can I be heard or? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so the, I think there are two kinds of, let's, I will not challenge the basic premise that you've put out, which is that the civil service is not delivering uh, as well as it should. So let's take that as a given, and I'm not disputing that. Then what are the solutions which one can think of? And I think in terms of how we, uh, the language that we use, I would say there are two kinds of solutions that one can discuss. One is basic structure kinds of questions, what we typically call basic structure. Let's look at the basic structure of the civil service. Should we change that? Now, of course, those changes would be more radical, more fundamental, potentially may have greater impact, but are much more difficult to do and may not happen. And then you have 
things that you, you can do within the existing structure, which may not be as radical, may not be as appealing in an, in a, in a, in a, in an academic sense, but may actually be easier to carry out. So I'll just touch on, on a few of those things. First, should we abolish, let's say, I mean, I'll start with one, but I mean, we can take this further. Should we abolish the IAS and replace it with, you know, um, position-based services? So a lot of, uh, the World Bank, for instance, you recruit against a position. You look at who's best suited to this position for these terms of reference, and uh, that's a possible thing that we could do. The other thing we could possibly do is to adopt many of the principles of new public management, what Australia and New Zealand have uh, done over the years. So I'll start first with the <coughs> basic structure questions, and let me start with the second one first, just because I'm not well prepared. Uh, the, the, this new public management. So this movement was a set of policies for the, I'm, I'm sure this audience is familiar with it, but it's, it has things like adoption of private sector managerial techniques, introducing competition in the provision of public services, separating policy and execution with policy in the secretariat and autonomous agencies executing those policies, separating purchasers of services from the providers of services, using performance contracts, performance-linked pay, a lot of these things that have been tried in other parliamentary democracies of, uh, with constitutions similar to ours. Uh, now, several of these are very popular. As I said, Mr. Narayan Muthi is a great believer in performance-linked pay particularly. Uh, and the logic of the commentary usually runs as follows. The private sector operates this way. The private sector is more efficient and competent than the government, and therefore, logically, those techniques, if applied in the government, must improve efficiency. Now, the factual basis for one and two is questionable because the private sector doesn't always use performance-based pay. Uh, and secondly, there are certain inherent differences between the kind of work the public sector does and the work the private sector does. And even, you know, a, a, an economist like Oliver Williamson, not exactly known to be a great supporter of bureaucracies, uh, said that replication of a public bureau by a private firm with or without regulation is impossible. He goes on to state that practices that are widely condemned, like low-powered incentives, convoluted bureaucratic procedures, excesses of employment security, actually serve legitimate economizing purposes. Uh, and Lant Pritchett, again, another economist that you wouldn't think is a great supporter of you know, uh, um, highly secure bureaucracies, says the provision of key discretionary transaction intensive services through the public sector is the mother of all institutional and organizational design problems. So the empirical evidence shows decisively that EM doesn't always work. It works sometimes, but it doesn't work sometimes. And uh, even the OECD's review of NPM in developed countries suggested that the reforms produced some unexpected negative results. So overall, while, I mean, and, and, and performance-linked pay is horribly difficult to do in government. If I get a, a position which is, uh, let's say, in the best district where taxes are easily collected, and if I have performance based on my collection percentage, I do very well. If I'm posted in a very backward district where things are very difficult to do, I may actually lose performance pay. How do you adjust the incentives to compensate for these? Horribly difficult, not really likely to happen in practice. So, and even on the issue of linking pay to performance, from an OECD perspective, several OECD countries have moved away from performance pay for government servants towards more of fixed pay. So, overall, while NPM might play a positive role in the right context, I don't think it offers a broad-based solution for the Indian problem. So, the next point that I made is abolish the IAS, move to position-based systems. You have two alternatives here. You could get rid of the IAS, move to a position-based system where you recruit for specific positions, or you could go to a ministry-based Mandarin service where you recruit bureaucrats for the Ministry of Finance, for the Ministry of this, and they remain within that ministry throughout their careers. Now, both of these have parallels in other countries, uh, but some of the problems that we face here, one, India has this federal dimension. If you wanted to do this, you would essentially be recruiting people who may or may not ever have worked at the lower tiers of government. So, do you want bureaucrats at the center who have also worked in the states and the local bodies? Or are you happy with people who have subject matter expertise but never have actually 
uh, handle the levers of government? I mean, how do, how do you answer parliamentary questions? How do you, you know, prepare for cabinet meetings? How do you conduct a dialogue with the state government? What are the powers of the state government vis-a-vis -vis the center? These are also specialized skills. They're a different kind of specialized skill. But some of those skills are essential for a functioning bureaucracy. And I think that's not something that we can get over in the Indian system. So the structure of the All India Services is different from the structure of a unitary service that you would have in a much simpler polity. And um, so I would... This is, it poses quite a big problem. And then let's look at the evidence. We do have uh, examples of specialized services. So you have the Indian Economic Service, you have the Indian Statistical Service, you have the Indian Forest Service. They're actually recruited against specialized examinations. They're not generalists. Then you have the ministry specialization equivalent in the Indian Revenue Service, the Indian Audit and Account Service, and so on. I'm not sure that anyone here would make the case that those services are distinctly more efficient, more productive, less bureaucratic, more effective, more accountable than, say, the Indian Administrative Service or the Police Service or the Foreign Service. So I think the evidence that we have within the country doesn't necessarily point in that direction. So th the simple point I'm making is I'm not sure the basic structure solutions are very clearly uh, advocate. I have a lot of points on the marginal solutions, but that is. Uh, but actually, I think that's a very important point to segue into the larger structural issue, Mr. Patra, if I could bring you in to this question, which is that the problem of state capability, the problem of building accountability into the state structure is not just about uh, the bureaucracy or, or the IAS and, the, and, and its multiple verticals. It's also fundamentally about how the state is organized about where and how power is located, uh, about the challenge of federalism. Uh, and I wanted to uh, ask you to reflect on your experiences, uh, particularly from the perspective of a state government, uh, where you know, it is the center that holds the first strings, but the state that has to do bu the bulk of the implementation, uh, which creates a, a power asymmetry uh, in some sense. So at least that's how I viewed it. So your thoughts on the structural constraints that make accountability a challenge for the Indian state? I have learned to evade questions most of my career, so I'll evade this. I'll tell you something <laughs> different. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something that, that the Indian state at the block, the tehsil, and the district level is facing a peculiar crisis. Uh, well, not a crisis there in a bit of a jam because now with the direct benefit transfer system, money going directly from here to that beneficiary, the elaborate mechanism that we had set up to disperse subsidy, that those chaps have become redundant very largely. And um, this is a very curious thing. There are chaps who are disbursing food subsidy. There were chaps who were doing fertilizer. There were chaps who were doing agriculture subsidy. Suddenly, there's this fair amount of bureaucracy at the sub-district <coughs> level, which doesn't really, and then chaps disbursing scholarships, which is also going directly. Uh, so the DBT, direct benefit transfer, has had a curious impact on these people. They are suddenly redundant. And can I, I mean, this is a very distinguished gathering. I was wondering what would they do? Do you need them for election, but that's once in two years or five years, whatever it is, you know, depending on the panchayat or municipality. You need them for disaster management. And if you really travel to marginal districts, you realize why you need a permanent bureaucracy. You have to show that the state exists. When you go to Manipur, when you go to, I've been traveling a lot to JNK. And you, you see where, when the DC, mere fact that DC office remains open is such a big deal. So I'm saying that, how do you redeploy? So in West Bengal, we had this problem. And Junaid will probably know that we had this schemes, programs, which were essentially delivering individual benefits. Scholarships, widow pension, X, Y, Z, you know. Now suddenly these things are directly, money is directly flowing to the beneficiaries. So the elaborate system of verification, checks, release of money is no longer relevant. You have talked about money being released. I think uh, Yamini had talked about money released from government of India to the state. Now this is very automatic. You know, the kind of constraint that I worked in, uh, in when I was a joint secretary, that doesn't exist. The money now directly seamlessly flows. And there is a very nice mechanism by which someone can check whether the money is gone or not. I was wondering that the new challenges that I see in West Bengal, I mean, was challenge of old age. Mm -hmm. We are getting an aging population. Mm -hmm which are actually in the rural areas has no support base at all. I mean, rural people do get old, they need support, they don't have old age homes, they don't have outreach people who can reach out to say X number of old people over the next 
one month or so and see whether they are still doing okay. Uh, no, they will get their pension right, the gold age pension will come but whether the person is around to take advantage is very difficult to figure out. The other one was child support services. I mean all the advanced social care services that an advanced country gives, we don't give. So is there a scope to reorient the bureaucracy, to retrain the bureaucracy at that level and allow them to do these kind of jobs? So I'm just actually raising a counter question. It is possible to think like this that otherwise these people will be hanging around without anything to do. So this is one of my points. I, I think you raise a very important point that e even though you evaded my question, actually hits at some very critical elements of it. Um, and Junaid, maybe I can bring you back on this, which is that with the, so, so there are two, there, there are two, two problems. One is around uh, the structure of power in the state. Are we over-centralized uh, and too thick uh, uh, in, in some parts and too thin where we need to be, especially if we are identifying accountability as a core challenge uh, that, that, uh, that undermines state capability. But linked to that, when we bring in new technology, uh, which in many ways comes in as a means of leapfrogging a lot of the challenges of accountability and state capability. In fact, we had a very long and detailed conversation about uh, technology in the afternoon as well, but it does pose this problem of whether uh, we are therefore further entrenching a certain kind of centralization because you are in some ways further thinning out the bureaucracy. You have a set of actors at the grassroots level who now are, uh, as Mr. Vitra rightly pointed out, uh, uh, you know, short of things to do in a sense, and not really able to respond to citizens' concerns because those responsibilities no longer rest in their control. So while we may have uh, potentially strengthened efficiency, have we done that at the cost of further taking the state away from where it matters the most at the grassroots? I think there, there, there are quite a few fundamental issues that, uh, uh, that were uh, raised here. Uh, one is, coming back to your question, state capability, the state is, is facing a world that's constantly changing. Question is, can the state change in response to those, those changes? If it can, then it's a capable state. So the question that Sanjit raises is, uh, uh, is clearly one where a different s setup has emerged. Is the state flexible enough to respond? And I think we have to look at the systems uh, by which state is managed to assess whether that capability exists. And that's the first, first point. Second point is, so I'm going to say, say it the way, way I see it. The future of India lies in the states of India. The future of India lies in federalism. The future of India lies in states capable of bringing the state close to the citizen. Technology may change, but it doesn't take away the, the need to have the presence of the state in front of citizens. If the state... Was that the state responding? Yeah. <laughs> no. if with technology changes, you'll see changing in the nature of the relation between the state and the citizen. But if the state disappears in front of the citizen, you have a very weak state. Uh, and, and I think that that also is an example of state capability, that ability to remain in touch with, uh, uh, with the citizens. Extremely, uh, uh, extremely important. I have to say, one of the things uh, in the World Bank uh, is over the years, we began to focus on privatization. We began to focus on communities. Uh, we began to focus on technology. And I think we forgot the state. And I think that this conversation of state capability is bringing back the, one of the constants in development, which is a capable state is absolutely essential for development. So the conversation of making a state capable is a conversation about making a state uh, uh, able to respond. And in today's world, with climate change and other type of changes, techno technological change, figuring out, figuring out how to make that state capable is a, is a very, big, uh, very big story. And my sense is, no matter how easy it is to uh, direct uh, benefit transfers, you will not be able to replace network goods or public goods in its nature for which you need a state close to the citizen. Absolutely. In fact, 
I don't know if it's, it's not just the World Bank that forgot about the state. I think India did too. Uh, and, you know, the, the infamous quip, India grows at night while the state sleeps. Uh, you know, we, we, in fact, I think the story of India over the last 20, 25 years has been a story of trying to find ways of bypassing, getting around uh, the state rather than taking the state head on and actually working through it to make it more capable and more responsive. And one of those issues, one, one of the tensions that uh, I think this, this desire to bypass, uh, to, to get around the, the problems of the state has been, I think, comes out in the arguments around lateral entry, generalists versus specialists, that again come up very often as one of the solutions to the challenge of state capability. And uh, Dr. Somanathan, I wondered if I could speak to that. That's obviously the moment of the day. Uh, and it goes back to some of the basic structure issues that you brought up as well. Uh, and I think come to me again comes to the heart of the problem. Are we focusing too much on, uh, on, on the people rather than the structures, the institutions, uh, the, the norms that they create uh, to make change happen? Uh, I think you raised the point of uh, lateral entry. And uh, if you remember, I began by saying you have basic structure issues and the others. I would actually see lateral entry as a very important part of the solution, but not necessarily a basic structure change. This country has had a lot of very distinguished lateral entrants in government at different points of time. What we've not had is a systematic method by which competent or you know, outstanding people from outside government come into government at different stages in their career. We've had it ad hoc when somebody has been taken into government. And I think that is not a revolutionary or, a, or I think it's something that can be done. I think it needs to be done. I think it adds a lot of value. So in terms of my vision of how this thing would work, I would think that, I mean, I'm, I'm being more specific than I need to be, just to be clear, I would say, Something like 80 to 90% of your officers in the secretariat would typically be career civil servants. Now, how their careers should be managed, uh, how should they get promoted, how should they come from the states, go back, that's another set of detailed questions. But, and then you would have, I would typically see something like 10 to 15% of people in senior positions coming from outside. And I think that would be the right mix. I mean, we can quarrel about the numbers a little bit, but I think that's the right mix that would get you the, uh, the experience and knowledge of state craft in the sense of working the Indian constitution, the Indian judicial system, all the precedents that we have, all the rules that have to be followed, and at the same time bringing in fresh perspectives, people with knowledge of their specialisms, people who have technical knowledge of you know, how to structure a, a, a bond index or you know, how to build a world-class railway. And you know, the, it's this mix that I think is the best way forward, if I can be very brief. I, I can get into details, but. Thank you. Just curious to hear your take Sorry, on. Just one thing I want to add. The test or the, the key point on the lateral entry is how do we make sure we get people of excellence and not people who are chosen for their political connections? That is the singular challenge on that, but it's a challenge that I think we have the institutions to confront it and to successfully do it. In fact, uh, so you, you touched upon uh, it, the, the next point that I wanted to make, but A, just curious to hear your views on lateral entry, uh, but also linked to this, I mean, the elephant in the room when we talk about state capability is always the politics. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a politician to defend, uh, on, on, on the panel to defend the, the role of politicians uh, in, in, in enabling or disabling the state, but wanted your reflections on the relationship between politics and bureaucracy, which often comes up from from a bureaucrat's perspective at any rate, as the fundamental point at where everything goes wrong. Tenures are too short, transfers are too fast, uh, too much uh, is asked for on file or not on file that can later become a challenge. So how do you see that dynamic as it has unfolded over the years? Uh, first, I want to say that I agree with Son that lateral entry is a great idea. I worked under one of the most distinguished lateral entries to government, so I'm very proud of that. So the, um, the thing is that I'm also intrigued by the generalist and specialist debate. Mm -hmm. I did some reading before I came here. I mean, all the big Indian companies, Hindustan, uh, HUL, ITC, um, Tata's. Tata's, they actually recruit young people, train them across a range of businesses. And a guy who's essentially not related to the cigarette business can go to cigarettes. A guy who doesn't do anything with dairy can hit the dairy unit. You don't really need to have an agricultural guy dealing with the dairy unit. 
uh, if you look at the world at large, McKinsey is a consultancy company and half the LM CEOs of various companies appear to be from McKinsey. And they presumably had a nice university degree, then they went to the McKinsey thing and they, now they run you know, Boeing, uh, General Electric, Vodafone. So I mean this generalist versus specialist debate can only go, I mean can go up to a point. Uh, at the at the state level, the politicians, there is an, let me clearly say, there is a disquiet among the political class about the utility of the generalist civil, civil service. I can sense that. My colleagues have sensed that there is a disquiet. And this comes up again and again. Therefore, you need to have a specialist. Therefore, you need to have a guy who is highly trained in X, Y, Z. But, uh, you know, it probably works as, you know, in, in case you're designing a very hi-fi, you know, swap program or something like that. Maybe it does. Probably it does. But when you have a multidisciplinary team at the block level, or which is the cutting edge, or at the TESI level or the district level, I'm not sure about this, uh, you know, sure anymore about how we should structure it. The politician class as a class has now great disquiet about the role of the general. It could be that there is a sense that these people serve two masters. I mean, in Delhi, there was a big tussle between the bureaucracy and the newly elected government, ironically by a former civil servant. But that was, I think there was a disquiet that who does this person owe his loyalty to? Is that the reason? I have many distinguished colleagues sitting here. Is that the reason? I don't know. But the, there is a disquiet and um, so then therefore there is a blame game going on. And um, does capacity exist in the political uh, thing? I am not very sure. Not at the, not at the block village level. No. Because we could not train the people. No, it's that, not there. That brings us, I hope you'll talk about local governments tonight. I, I wanted to bring it up, and I think we've segued right into it. So. Uh, I will talk about local governments, but I just wanted to say that uh, over the years, as I've worked uh, in different countries uh, in the World Bank, I have found that most of the development problems that we face uh, are not sectoral, but cross uh, sectors and that the ability to connect is absolutely vital. Uh, today we're working in Punjab, and in Punjab the electricity, water and agriculture nexus cannot be solved by the electricity specialist or the water specialist or the ag specialist by themselves. So I've also uh, come to a, a recognition that this generalist versus specialist is, uh, is overdone in terms of a, of a discussion. Uh, and, uh, and I think that if we don't have the right mix, especially in a complex world, which is ironic because people say in a complex world you need specialists. My sense is in a complex world you need connectors uh, even more. Uh, on local government, what, what aspect did you want me to... Uh, we'll get to... I think you wanted to uh, say something on... Oh, oh, sorry. I thought that's what Mekla was saying. You no, know, I, I just wanted, you know... Again, going back to where we began, accountability at the core. We've, we've touched on this again and again in the, in the sense of where is the state located and how does that location then uh, in, enable the state to be genuinely accountable. Uh, and yet India doesn't do very well when it comes to empowering and strengthening local governments. Uh, and you have been engaged with this question now for many decades. What are we caught in a chicken and egg? Because in that always brings up this, the, the issue of capability and capacity at the grassroots. Um, and ha is, is that chicken and egg something that is preventing us from building capability? Well, I think if you look at the 21st century India, the 21st century India is, is an urban India. And nowhere in the world do we see an effective urban nation managed centrally. You have to manage urban at the, at the local level, at the city level. And I think one of the biggest challenge, uh, challenges that India faces is what will be its paradigm of urban management. Uh, if you look around the world, uh, I'll say it in a stylized w way, there seems, to be, uh, uh, there seems to be two models of effective city management. One is a fully empowered mayor, powers to run it. I think the, the vision of 74th Amendment may have been that. Then the other is state managers that are asked to run, uh, run uh, uh, cities. The, the, the similarity between a mayor that runs a city and a state manager that runs a city is they're in charge of the city, where the city is 
is, is like a little country and the interconnections have to be managed together. You can't deal with transport unless you deal with uh, urban land zoning, for example. Uh, so you need empowered local leaders to manage cities. Then you have the third model, which is South Asian model, which is cities are managed vertically, fragments uh, in a fragmented way. In my city, Dhaka City, is run by 18 agencies responding to four central uh, line ministries. Uh, and people will say that the real mayor of Dhaka is the prime minister of, uh, of Bangladesh. And, and if you look at the traffic jams that are in, Bangladesh, in Dhaka today, it's not surprising because police responds to one line ministry, uh, road, uh, roads building belongs to another one, uh, 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 simple land zoning belongs to a third one. That accountability is so diffuse that a citizen at the city level can't hold the mayor accountable for the delivery of services. So local government uh, is, in a, certainly in an urban system, is going to require uh, far more strengthening. And I think that when I say that the future of India lies in federalism, uh, I've come away from a sense that the centrally sponsored schemes that have been created in India to try to change the local level actually will not work. And that if you want the local to work, you have to empower the state. There has to be a political economy challenge between the state and the local, and that different states will respond to it differently. That unless federalism is uh, created, you're not going to get uh, local government to, uh, to really emerge. Uh, you look at the emergence of, of, uh, uh, of JNN and URM, and you look at the emergence of uh, the uh, smart cities, they have a very top-down approach to local government. And I think that it's time very much to really move towards a, a story of a local empowerment. Uh, but how that will happen, I think that political shift can only happen in a context of a, a much deeper federalism in India, not a more centralized uh, system of, say, centrally sponsored schemes. Would you agree with that proposition? We need to be more federal if we need to build a capable state? Mind if I just give you an anecdote? Absolutely. It, it involves uh, a country, the World Bank, and the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. So I mean, it, <laughs> it's not directly on point. But uh, when Mr. Roberto Zaga visited Chennai, somewhere between 2000, and I think one of the ministers of Panchayati Raj then is here in this room today. Uh, the, he visited Chennai, and he said, "You see, Mr. Chief," he said it in English. The Chief Minister could understand, but waited for a translation, and then we translated back. So he said. Uh, Mr. Chief Minister, I come from Brazil, and in Brazil I come from Sao Paulo, and the mayor of Sao Paulo is considered more powerful than the governor of the state of Sao Paulo. But here in India, when I come here, I see that you know, mayors are very weak, and the chief ministers are very powerful, and the governments, uh, you know, the state government dominates the cities. So, Mr. Chief Minister, do you think that in our lifetime, we will see empowered municipalities in India? So this was the question. So the chief minister took a moment, and he was, um, he was very good uh, with words, especially in Tamil. But uh, So what he said in English, I'll translate, was he said, I'm extremely happy to know that in your country, uh, the municipal as powerful as state governments. I'm really happy to know that. Unfortunately, the situation in India is very different. The states are only as powerful as municipalities. And it's a central government that dominates everything. And could you please do something about this? <laughs> So, but the, the point that I'm making is that uh, the, the, it's not just the British, but I think the tradition of state governments viewing political competition from big cities as not desirable, is, it's, it's partly because we are a democracy. I think they would be more comfortable with appointed state managers. But if you have empowered mayors, I think that is not something that fits well into the democratic polity that we have at the state level in respect of urban local. For lo rural, they're okay with that. But the mayor of Chennai, if he was really empowered, would be a rival power center to the chief minister of Tamil Nadu. And I'm not sure that that is something that people would really be. I mean, that's why exactly I, I refer to a city manager model, because I think India will, one way or the other, uh, look at this model of city managers, uh, because that is a relation between the state and the city mediated through a very different, uh, different way. Now, remember that a city manager, 
uh, accountability is upwards, not downwards. So is that the, the democracy that India uh, would allow? But unless and until there is some form of management of cities as cities, whether it's through mayors or through city managers, you have a, uh, uh, a uh, challenge in terms of urban, uh, uh, urban management. Mekha, quick question, because you're eating into audience questions. <laughs> commissions. Yes, yes, we are Public, hoping to do that. I, I'm so glad because this is an yes. institution that has been allowed to atrophy and most of them are characterized by FIRs filed against the previous incumbent and they are the key institutions to put, if you talk to a person selected by a PSC and a person not selected by a PSC, the contrast will be stark and I'm so glad you're doing that. I am really, really happy. Thank you. Absolutely, they should be. So this is great. And to take on uh, some uh, Calcutta, the mayor earlier was a genuinely, you know, he was a politician separate from. Uh, then he kind of felt orphaned, and now the mayor is also a minister. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> very quick, uh, a very very quick question. I mean, in terms of talking about the need to build capacity in local government, I mean the other big challenge is really regulatory capacity. And in some ways, when we think about the shift from provision to regulation, we think about it requiring less capacity, but in many ways it requires even more capacity. And it would just be interesting to hear your comments on how does India really think about the challenge of building regulatory capacity, because I think we've spent a fair amount of time thinking about service delivery capacity, but I think on the question of regulatory capacity, we are still in very early stages of thinking about systems and institutions. Correct. For almost what, 15 years, yeah, 20, years. 20 years, and it's a well functioning, it's a reasonably okay functioning system except for the fact that there are political economy issues and pricing with which the regulator can do very little about. But as a, it hears petitions, it hears objections, it passes fairly decent orders, half of which get implemented, which is not bad. And uh, there is an extensive consultative process. There is an interactive process between the regulators to the forum of regulators. It's not too bad. I mean, it's actually, the PSC is a system of regulator which needs, which needs a much more closer attention. The other regulators are, maybe some can, they're central regulators, so many of them. Before you answer that, let's just take a, uh, we, we stand between <coughs> dinner and uh, <laughs> the panel. So we'll just take three questions, Deepak, and then the, uh, Shahana, and then the gentleman there. I just have a provocative proposition and I'd like your reaction. I think state is extremely capable in India. It is feared, constantly feared or approached as a supplicant. And that's what the state wants. Why are we saying, talking all this about state capability being missing from the, are we talking from the angle of whom? It's the state which says I'm pretty capable. I'm feared and everybody approaches me as a supplicant. Why do I need to, who wants to change? <laughs> Question is mostly for Junaid and it's about the 21st in, uh, century state for urban India. Um, to what extent is the, is is all are these changes in state capability a function of the state, or what are the external forces acting on the state? Because if you think of a state that has acquired it, Delhi is one, and it hasn't been a result of any sorts of major institutional changes. And a lot of experiments where you've had institutional changes, they aren't really doing it. Um, and there, if you look at the differences in which you have capable states, uh, say Gujarat or Kerala, both are relatively capable states, but they're capable in very different ways. Uh, so Karan, and then we take Aditi at the back and hand back to the front. <laughs> <laughs> so someone else should be the judge. Um, this is a question about uh, most of the bureaucrats around, uh, you know, initiatives such as state capacity initiative and, you know, I along with many others in this room work on and think about state capacity. Uh, but there are very few examples where the government has been able to integrate those research findings 
into actual policy making, into actual policy decisions. What do you think, uh, you know, as bureaucrats, as people who use our evidence, uh, who think about our evidence, what do you think academics and researchers should do better so that some of the work we are doing is able to actually lead to policy changes, both locally but also more nationally. Uh, Aditi Padnes from the Business Standard newspaper. I'm a reporter, so please uh, overlook my frankness or bluntness. Uh, I am just wondering, uh, you know, the it's nice to admire the problem of lateral entry, but uh, the system has not been exactly kind to people who have entered laterally. Uh, you, we've just seen a, a book by Monte Kaluvalia where he says that until he got the backing of the political leadership, he continued to be some kind of a, I don't know, a prey or a victim of the system. And the same, uh, I mean, I may be telling tales out of school, but the same applies uh, to the current CEA and the previous CEA and the, uh, the, the gentleman who was asked by the Prime Minister's office to rewrite uh, this issue of performance-linked uh, promotions in the civil services. And I believe that that report is just not not being addressed. He was also a lateral entrant. And forget lateral entry of people who are doyens in their profession. Uh, even people from the state services are have recounted to us many times how seriously um, uh, challenged they feel in working with the system. So what is the answer to this? A quick two minutes for all three of you to respond. So I quite get the question. Do you no, for me, the one on the... From Urban Shahana, you want yeah. to just... Or institutional design, and the, the Shimla case would be one. Was it the corporatization, or was it the fact that they had directly elected mayors? Uh, so, much more so, I mean, I think that changes uh, only happen if there is a political uh, uh, process behind it. In the case of Shimla, there was a natural shock, which was affecting the state in a very deep way. It builds on tourism, and here you have water pollution. Uh, that uh, and water shortage that might affect the nature of the uh, of the economy and the political system then reacted to say we need to do something so the shock may come from outside there may be a crisis but the change has to be one that is supported uh, uh, politically without without any doubt I don't think you can divorce the uh, politics uh, from uh, from uh, uh, policy changes uh, if you do I don't think any policy changes uh, is sustainable I'll try to answer the question on the research part of it. I think first, you may be underestimating the impact that you're making because typically in the bureaucracy, we don't cite. So we, we have no copyrights within the civil service. So we do read and we sometimes absorb and sometimes use without citation. We don't cite us, ourselves internally or externally. But, uh, but it's a fact that a lot of the research doesn't get absorbed as much as it should. I think the only suggestion that I would give is if researchers could try to internalize what the policy makers also... For, let me give you just an example to illustrate. So a lot of people say, you know, your revenue estimates for this year and next year are too high, okay? And then you keep reading the paper and it says, you know what, revenue estimates are too high, you know what, the fiscal deficit is too high, you know what, public expenditure is too low, and you know what, there's too much extra budgetary borrowing. So what I would like from a research paper is, if the revenue estimates fall short, would you like us to increase the budget deficit? Would you like us to cut public expenditure? Or would you like us to increase off budget? I don't have a fourth choice. But most papers that I read condemn all four of, all three of these options. And so you leave me free to pick whichever one I think is best. So if you're not willing to commit and look at the choices that a real life bureaucrat has to make, then the impact of research, I would actually prefer someone who picks a choice, even if it's not the one that I agree with, because then I can actually study it and understand why I don't agree with it. But a lot of research papers 
right for an audience that is not the policymaker. And then it's, it's very easy to say everything government does is bad, you know, estimation is poor, too high fiscal deficit, wasting money, cut this, but it's not helpful. So I think if you could target, if you're really looking at influencing policy, you need to internalize the challenges that a real policymaker is making. And uh, actually I can give you one or two uh, examples of where uh, a considered study has had impact. The one is something very strange called the availability-based tariff, which is the way of uh, pricing, you know, excess demand or supply in the power system. It came out of a report. It came out of a study, and the government adopted it in total, and it's now in operation. It's been in operation now for 15, 20 years. There have been many such cases. I mean, uh, in my province of West Bengal, we designed this direct benefit scheme for girl children. It came out of a study. It came out with the most obvious study that a direct benefit to a girl child will increase, uh, you know, age of marriage, will, well, actually copied from his state. I mean, the Dhanalakshmi scheme, which was there 30 years ago. So people wrote about it and people, other people picked it up. It's not that policy in India happens in vacuum. No. Um, actually, I have not read Dr. Aluwalia's book. And so I'm a little intrigued that uh, he was not treated well by the system. I'm a little confused. Um, uh, uh, I must be getting my facts wrong, but there are many more distinguished lateral entrants. I can see at least one in, my, in the audience. There are many others, sir. I mean, Dr. Manmohan Singh was one. Manto Sondi one, D.V. Kapoor was one, Lavraj Kumar. I mean, the whole list of distinguished Arun Mayra. I mean, this, it, it just doesn't happen like that. I mean, it doesn't... Uh, this, to say that, you know, lateral entry, entrants are dis pushed around, I don't think it's correct. If you are if you're not good enough, you will get pushed around. If you have a lot of gas, you will get pushed around. You know, so if you have substance, nobody pushes you around in the government. I mean, you know, it's, it's not very easy to push around a lateral entrant because all of us assume that he already has some backing to be where he is. <laughs> <laughs> or she is. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's not correct. And to, uh, I mean, I'll... Uh, fear, uh, uh, Deepak has taken uh, an extreme line, but the state does deliver services. We deliver, uh, you know, um, small things, widow pension, scholarships, agriculture subsidy. I mean, people did these jobs and they did them reasonably, you know, well, didn't do it very well, but it's not a question of fear all the time. Just on the, on the lateral entry, uh, uh, I think something that uh, uh, TV was mentioning that if you are going to bring in lateral entry, you need an institutional setup that, uh, uh, that manages that well. I think if lateral entry is done systematically, you need to build a structure that manages lateral entry, including when you have brought people in to, uh, uh, to really uh, embed them in the system. We in the World Bank, uh, uh, a few years ago, did a major structural shift, uh, and all these senior directors were created, and about 40% were lateral entry, except there was nothing done to support them when they had come in. So within a year and a half, that 40% literally left. Because it was, you know, vast machinery. If you haven't been inside it, you don't understand it. So if lateral entry is going to be practiced, there has to be a machinery around that. Then, then there is no reason why, why, it, uh, uh, why it, can't, uh, it can't work. The other thing I want to say is, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the discussions uh, should not be seen as uh, uh, one of deep institutional change versus uh, change at the margin. I think uh, what we're learning is that you can't wait for deep institutional changes to make a difference in state capability. There are entry points, and especially those who work within the state uh, have a sense of how to create those entry points. And I think we need to use those entry points and hope that those entry points snowball into uh, the type of institutional shift that you want, uh, uh, you want over, uh, uh, over time. Well, thank you all. 
uh, for, uh, for what has been a really, really important uh, and fun discussion. Uh, and it lays out for us uh, some of the core issues. Uh, it, it's a bit daunting and at the same time truly exciting. And thank you for your support uh, as we go forward in this journey. Uh, thanks to all of you. And thanks for, to everyone for being here.